Hey folks, good morning. Uh, welcome to the ABM Voice podcast. I'm your host, Arun Kopalaswamy. Today I'm joined by Jolie Shapiro from Caspian Studios. She leads the growth marketing initiatives for them. I have to spend some time today with her, understand how she approaches demand gen, B2B marketing, her experience with content and various other things. I'm really ex- uh, looking forward for this discussion. And uh, welcome to the show, Jolie. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Let's just get started by getting to know you a little bit better, right? So I know I've covered a little bit, but if you could just trace path your your career so far, it's been uh, almost a decade, I suppose. Yeah. So I started off as a songwriter. I started writing songs mm. when I was 11 years old. And I wrote a song about, I was on a trip. Oh, was it a school field trip? And I wrote a song mm. about pain because I was this angsty 11 year old. And then all mm. the parents, I sang it and it was very well received, but all the parents called my mother asking if I needed help, <laughs> <laughs> which was, I was fine. I was just an angsty, I was just an angsty preteen. So um, always love writing. I've tried writing books. I've tried, I've, oh, I've six, I wrote like a few chapters when I was 15. And then, um, I was in the music industry, so I interned at like Warner and EMI back when it was EMI, now it's bought out by Universal and Universal and went on to content strategy. So I I was like, okay, I'm I'm in the music industry. What do I do next? I love to write. I was, I switched majors three times. I did like journalism and then advertising and then, um, telecom and ultimately ended up in PR, there's four majors. And then um, I went on to content strategy, like I mentioned. Um, So I did that for three years through Upwork. And then I went on to a marketing agency that worked for American Express or their primary client was American Express as an account coordinator. And then I fell into B2B SaaS. I didn't know I was in B2B SaaS, it was back in 2017. But it was, hmm. it was kind of like the punky, like I called the punky spunky underdog of Cision, the a media monitoring company. So I worked there and I accidentally did a demand generation campaign without knowing it. It was an influencer hmm. marketing campaign where we asked influencers, what's your secret to success in marketing? And it went viral, at least in the marketing community. It was like 7 million organic impressions all over the world, wow. which was amazing. Um because some of these some of these influencers had 250,000 followers. So all of them reposting it was absolutely mm-hmm. incredible. And we also made an ebook out of it, generated a couple hundred leads. So that was, I was like, oh wow, I really love this. <laughs> I love, I love the okay. ROI. Um, because I was really tied to the data and content strategy and blogging and social media back when it was really popular. Um, but then I so I studied for about three, four years, um, got certificates, did like next MBA, did um, like digital marketing Institute. Um, and I got, got a bunch of certifications. I've, it was a lot of studying. I felt like I got a master's in marketing mm-hmm. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. uh, and then I went on to three, three or four B2B tech companies within the past like mm-hmm. six years. Um, hmm. I love, I love tech. I think it's just, I think it's just, especially MarTech. It's just, um, it's just such an interesting field. And now I'm at Cassian, which is a B2B podcast as a service company, primarily work with tech companies, pretty, pretty hmm. large tech companies like, um, IBM and Dell and Segment and Twilio and that sort of thing. So I'm really happy here. It's, it's a great transition and a really good hmm part of my career it seems so i think yeah so many experiences so many learnings what's the what's the best part of writing so do you do you have writer's block at all or writing comes naturally yeah so i (laughs) funnily enough so when i was young it just flowed like i had Mm. i had these melodies that would come into my head and then Mm. i would have the lyrics at the same time so I just, mm. I'd write and I had probably like up to 50, a hundred songs by the time I was in my twenties. Um, wow. But it's definitely, it's, it's interesting, you know, cause chat GPT has made writing easier, but it's also, 
if I use it too much, it actually stifles my creativity because it's so easy to generate content, but it's not good content. Chat, I don't think mm. chat GPT is really there yet. Like it gets you probably 80% of the way, but mm. maybe not, maybe not 80%, maybe 60% mm. of the way, but True. it's, it's definitely, I think that's almost hurt me more than helped me. So I'm, I'm kind of mm. like going back to foundation of, okay, let me be, let me use my brain. Okay. Between uh, songwriting versus maybe like copywriting or or uh, ad copywriting, none of that, right? So, so is there a commonality? Is uh, uh, does the brain work differently or how? Um, that's a good question. I think ad copy, I use probably more the logical side hmm. because I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to use what what customers would say about us. And then songwriting is all is very emotional. So mm -hmm. it's like pure, pure emotion. Um, but yeah, the ad copy is more like, okay, so what, what do people want to hear? What do people want? What do people, what would someone on the other end, what would I want to know? What would I want to um, mm -hmm. like, it, like see from the other side? and putting myself yeah. in their shoes. Very, very awesome. And you've done some viral campaigns, right? So the whole demand generation area, how have you seen it evolve over uh, the last six, seven years that you've been associated? What's new? What has changed? What has not changed? What should not change? Yeah, I. that's a really great question. I love that question. So... When I first started, it was all about SEO and blogging. It was all about mm -hmm. SEO blogging and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. When I when I first started as a content strategist, and then I went out when I went into demand generation, um, it was all MQL hamster wheel, like just getting as many leads as you could, as fast as you could, and giving them to sales. And a lot of times they weren't qualified, and so how it's changed. I think, I think dark social is a really big thing. I think people mm. want to learn from their peers. So, and people want to learn, you know, with on the go and on their own time and not, they don't want to really be sprayed and prayed. That was a big, that was a big thing back then too. There was a lot of mm. batch. I used to call it batch and blast. It was when you mm. send out a sales email to 10,000 people and hope for five meetings, like that's not, that's not scalable. And that's not good conversion. So I think what should stay and something that we do at Caspian is we, I think in terms of ABM, we use persona based targeting through podcasting. So like, for example, uh -huh. our customers will, they will, um, oh yeah. So our customers will target a excuse me, specific persona. Like for example, VMware has a CIO exchange podcast and they'll target CIOs and they'll bring them onto their mm -hmm. podcast. And then they close 10 to 20% of people that they bring on. So like, that's something mm -hmm. that I think is new, but at, or mm -hmm. new ish, but I think it's here to stay. I think um, co-marketing initiatives are really big. We've seen a lot of success with partner webinars, um, mm -hmm. CEOs being, influencers in their own right on LinkedIn. I think like people versus brands on LinkedIn, I think is big and communities. That's where I really see it. What's working now versus back mm -hmm. then. Just see, so you talk about something called demand creation, your own, like, and then you consciously use that word you said, right? Explain uh, that to us. Sure. So, <laughs> I mean, that, Demand creation. I'm listening to Chris Walker's podcast for probably a year or two now. So that, that is ingrained into my mind, demand creation. And I follow all of his, uh, his employees on LinkedIn. So I read about it all the time, but I guess in my own words, it's about engaging the 95% of prospects that aren't in market. So there's the 5% mm -hmm. that you can either do assumed intent with ABM intent outbound or you can just, you can do cold, cold ABM, like target your ABM accounts, but people that have no idea who you are and if you're trying to build a category, 
building that brand awareness and through like stuff like, um, like the podcasting I mentioned or, um, or, or, or webinars or, um, or dark social communities. Like that's, that's creating demand, putting your name out there and you're really, you're really front and center. Like for example, we have this, we have this newsletter that, that is super successful because we're top of mind with like, for example, we'll have people sign up because they downloaded our ebook or people sign up for X, Y, Z reason. And we're top of mind until they're ready to buy. So for, so we huh. actually sent out a business murderverse, which I can get to a little later. Um, we sent out a business murderverse product launch and we got a ton of people that responded because they were already reading it for the past six months. So by the time we did mm. like a soft launch, we got, it, there were so many people that were interested. Uh, what do you package in a, in a newsletter and how do you like, uh, what frequency is that typically? Yeah, sure. So it's once a week, we typically highlight an employee, highlight a customer, yeah. and then our CEO does an intro of his own, of a kind of like a personal spin. We like keeping huh. it personalized and coming from him because he's really, he's the face of the company. We also sometimes highlight different podcast launches, but we don't, it's not really a sell. It's not like, hey, book a meeting with us. It's very much a nurture, nurture campaign. Uh -huh. So it it's really probably one of our top performing. The newsletters? Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, the newsletter. Uh -huh. And how do you acquire subscribers? Do you call promoter or inbound? Inbound, okay, okay. Yeah, like they'll be so on you, our you have site. Some... Oh, okay. sorry. Go ahead. So you have kind of a lead magnet, and then you use it, try right? give some value, and then make them mm -hmm. just subscriber. Okay, yep. interesting. But right, and uh, okay. So this whole thing is what you we call it as demand creation. Yeah. So in a broader sense, I think it's about like I mentioned, like engaging the people that have no idea who you are hmm. creating demand for your product when they're not, when they might not be in market, not because they don't like you or because they're not searching for the product, but because they just don't know who you are and they don't know that they hmm. even have a problem. Okay. okay. How does it differ from demand generation? It's not a wordplay, I suppose, right? So there is some distinction between these two. Yeah. So demand generation, I'd like to, I'd, I'd consider more, I'd associate that more with MQLs demand generation. I think it, I think it mm -hmm. is kind of phasing out a little bit. I think mm -hmm. demand generation could, is more channel based in terms of um, like generating, like you have a 5,000 MQL target let's let's do as much as we can to get those mqls for sales and i think that's really put that's really put marketing i think in a tough position you hear around the linkedin echo chamber like we're we can be arts and crafts and <laughs> we can be arts and crafts and sales assistants and that's something that hmm. i think demand creation is fixing um hmm. and i think demand generation also has more to do with demand capture versus mm -hmm. Versus, um, or excuse me, demand generation is more to do with man capture than, and more like the MQLs and like targeting your list with ebook downloads, stuff like that, like very low intent quality leads mm. um, versus demand creation, mm. which is more brand awareness. Huh. Interesting. And how do you fit in something like an ABM? So, so if you have an ABM program running, right? So how do you marry these two? What? Marry the demand creation and ABM? Yeah, yeah, hey, BM, yeah. Yeah, so we do a couple things. So we'll, so we participate in communities. We have our own community, actually, of, we have this podcast, our own podcast called Remarkable, where we bring, so our ABM strategy is, is kind of different. I touched on a little bit earlier. Um, so we create demand by having people listen when they want, how they want on the go. And then we capture demand by talking. They, they have such a great experience on the podcast 
that we close like 10 to 20 percent of our of our own pipeline um through podcasting mm. so okay. instead of cold outbound like for example we did an a b test where we did like our best performing cold outbound email and then we did mm. remarkable invites and that mm. was like a i forget what the percentage increase was but it was like a 50 percent 60 percent response rate something ridiculous and then mm. closing 10 to 20 percent of those deals and we're targeting very specific personas in our icp mm. So we segment mm. target position or position target. Mm. Um, so that's probably our best performing ABM strategy. Okay. So it sounds like you're using podcasts and maybe a bit of newsletter as a, as a way to channel and then bring these accounts that could be a possible shoot to your ICP and then you filter and then start doing some specific ABM campaigns, right? Yeah. Yeah, so newsletters... Oh, I was just going to say, so webinars too. No, we also do a, yeah, a lot of webinars, webinars too. Right. Okay. Okay. So these are the things, the uh, different channels that are feeding your pipeline. And then what kind of activities do you do to nurture them? And how long does it take for you in your case? And what kind of uh, more personalized interventions do you do? And what other channels do you activate as part of nurturing? Sure. So we'll do, we will do gifts. Um, so we use not Sendoso, like for example, this, uh, this t-shirt we sent, <laughs> we sent out to different prospects, customers, friendlies, influencers, um, so as a holiday gift, but it's again, like, Hey, so we know you're going to deal with us. Happy holidays. We'll see you in Q1. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so to, so to give them like a kind of like a, and we actually did it. We had them order it a group order so they could pick their own size. A lot of times people will just get a gift and it's not, or like a t-shirt or some sort of swag and it's not in their size, which right. can be not great. Um, yeah. so that's one avenue. Another is we also use our CEOs LinkedIn because he's an okay. influencer in his own right so he'll he'll i think a lot of times he'll well not a lot of times all the time every time he posts something he'll comment he'll respond to all the comments he's very active and hmm. that also will nurture people that are already in pipeline because they'll they've already connected they'll see the next product launch or the new ebook or hmm. you know xyz and that will pull them more down the funnel. Like for like we've had some cust we've had some prospects that will because we announce a webinar on LinkedIn, they'll go they'll go watch it hmm. because of LinkedIn. Hmm. And they're already in hmm. they're already in pipeline. Uh, who gets it to the webinar? Are these the accounts that is qualified and they're part of the nurture process? You invite them or well, I'm wondering what stage of their buying journey do they get to participate? Um, we, we typically do, m see, it's funny. So I, I consider, I, I, I don't want to say I don't believe in buying stages. That's not fair. But I, I'd like to say that it, it we're pretty much open to everyone because the, the content that we talk about is top of funnel. But then if they want to mm. learn more, We'll give them like mm. something like an ROI calculator or six winning plays to drive pipeline with a podcast or um, podcast planning worksheet, stuff like that. So we have more bottom of the funnel content, but in terms of webinars, it's anyone that wants to join. We don't, we don't have specific criteria for a webinar. Okay. No. How do you get them to join your webinar? Is it through newsletter? Is it through social or is it? Newsletter or social, okay. Uh, and and how frequently do you run those webinars? This is about. It's been about once a month. Once so a we month. Par okay. we partner with um, people like Audience Plus and Demand Jump and Goalcast, and we've run webinars with them. So hmm. we both we we market. We basically partner with MarTech companies because we're both targeting the same audience. So we both, hmm. everyone wins. It's a win-win for everyone for, for the co-marketing okay. initiatives. Good. And what, what kind of channels do you use for pipeline marketing? So somebody who's qualified, maybe there's an opportunity that you're trying to convert. So are there programs specifically for them? Yep. 
Yep. So we do paid. We'll do we'll mm-hmm. do LinkedIn retargeting. So for example, we have a customer testimonial that, oh my gosh, when I when I got off the interview, I was like, I can die happy now because it was the best customer interview I've ever had. Um, mm-hmm. But we'll we'll use that. We for we're specifically using customer testimonial, single ad images and with the, the quote. And then we also have a video, about a two minute video for retargeting with um, with the with our customer. And it's performing really, mm. really well. Testimonials. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. For our and this is for... okay. This is for what stage? Is it like tofu, mofu, bofu? After they, they probably get mo- the mofu, pipeline. bofu. Yeah, mofu, mm. bofu. So we typically retarget if they click on a like a Google, like a Google ad, um, or sometimes it'll be SEO driven. Or, and then we'll get the cookie, which is phasing out. So mm-hmm. we're all going to have to figure mm-hmm. that out as marketers. <laughs> um, right, yeah. But then we'll, and then we'll retarget. So mostly middle and bottom of the funnel. Got it. Okay. And how do you, when do you activate sales? When do the sales people get involved? Yeah. So typically, so for now, because we don't have, um, we don't have alerts yet. We're still setting it up. So I'm the, I was the first marketing hire on this team. So we're still building the foundation, but for now it's when we do mostly inbound. So we'll do mostly mm-hmm. inbound leads and then we qualify based on just as, if they're an ICP fit. So we have gold bronze, excuse me, gold, silver, t- bronze, just based mm-hmm. on ARR. And then, so once I qualify, I'll put them into a sequence and then, then sales takes over because they'll respond directly to that email. Okay. Okay. And uh, how does the newsletter and webinars and others, uh, what, what stage do they get to see and start seeing those channels uh, or cut from those channels? So they, they'll they go directly to us. So they, hmm. they come, because of those channels, they'll come in they'll come in inbound. So we, we don't, I don't want to say we wait, but we, they'll come in because of a lead or excuse me, because mm. of a channel, not, not mm. the other way around. We don't really do app on prospecting with the exception of, and they're, they, the sales handoff is more like, is mostly inbound, but then we'll also do the remarkable invites for our podcast, which is more mm. outbound. Hmm. So the remarkable podcast is like you inviting a certain prospect into the conversation and then having a chat. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's and a do, successful do you, channel. Okay. Do you, uh, do, do, do you do this for all the prospects or you, do you select like what kind of criteria do you sort of uh, use to pick up who gets to be the guest? Yep. Yep. So we have an ICP, ICP. So our ICP hmm. is, so we have the gold, silver, bronze, which is the ARR. Right. And then we'll have, um, it's mostly people in marketing. So, but not, but our primary is VP of brand, CMO. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, oh, director of content strategy and mostly, hmm. mostly more content like brand and brand. Um, and then like a hmm. secondary would be like a director of demand gen stuff like that, but hmm. that's, it's more of the persona. Correct. Okay. And and what, what do you generally talk in this podcast? Is it very educational in nature or are you trying to uncover problems? Do they have or, right? So either implicitly or explicitly. So, so like, is there a, like a, like a strategy that you have in terms of engaging them through the remarkable podcast? Yeah. So we have a podcast prep call. And mm. a lot of times we'll gauge if they're interested in doing a podcast with us during the, mm. or during the prep call. Um, mm-hmm. And it'll be either be yes or no and no hard feelings. If not, and you'll still be on our podcast. Mm. It's not a gateway, <laughs> but mm. um, actually the, the content's really interesting. It's B2B content marketing. So for example, we did a podcast on Taylor Swift Eras tour and mm. the person you, the person had, they discuss um, our CEO and whoever the guest is will discuss the takeaways and the marketing lessons learned from that particular pop culture reference. It could, or 
It could be the Matrix. It could be the Muppets. It could be the Office. Who, whatever they want to mm-hmm. pick, and they mm-hmm. and they talk about it. And it's I think it's really interesting because there's so many things that we can learn from from B two C content and kind yeah. of like the you know the Marvel universes of the world and all mm-hmm. that. So I I find it I think it's a really good concept. Awesome. And you you talked about social. uh selling or social conversation right so you see you go some like commons rights and all of that uh at what point do you let's say connect with your prospects right so you get this inbound request they've done some maybe they've just they, they heard your podcast right so they go to your website fill a form and then they show interest right so they've got it to funnel right you qualifying handing it or you're putting them into a sequence and you're also activating your sales folks and then like how do you layer the social element on as as part of this process so we typically like i mentioned we do retargeting to move them further down the okay. funnel once they are in pipeline but mm-hmm. in terms of accelerating pipeline like i mentioned we'll do gifts we'll do and then the ceo will and then we'll do the newsletter well cuz they're all everyone in pipeline is also the newsletter we'll do mm-hmm. and then we'll invite them to certain things and then in turn and then we'll send them more bob in the funnel content like i mentioned like the ROI calculator the podcast planning worksheet the um the six winning plays so we'll send them more like stuff that they can kind of figure out on their own and then if they want to talk to us they want to talk to us if they don't mm-hmm. then again no hard feelings but um mm-hmm. we tip it we're still building it out to be completely frank like I just I just built Salesforce with the ground from the ground up with a contractor. So now that mm-hmm. now that we have Salesforce up and running, we can really look at the data and see and really dig in dig into the data and analytics and um and and really get into okay, who are the accounts? How do we engage them? Okay, they're in pipeline. How do we move them from one phase to another? But we had to get the infrastructure up it within mm. the past 6 months to be able to really start doing that so actually it's funny after this call <laughs> uh there are most of today's heads down to do key one marketing strategy but what's great is we have some data to work off of now in terms mm. of what mm. we're going to do going forward huh. how do you measure all this the the uh, right so there like multiple child uh, everybody is getting in, in in different times Right, so like what's your dashboard looking like and then how do you continuously optimize and do sort of thing Oh my dashboard is it's so many colors <laughs> there are so many it is uh, so many colors because we have so green. many different What's that? More green Oh it's it's a lot More of uh, oh oh I meant like cuz there's so many different lead sources we it, they come in uh-huh. through so many mm-hmm. different ways but it's like basically a rainbow um Sorry, what was your question? I I missed it. Uh I was, I was talking about like how do you how do you measure uh the impact and right the influence of different channels and how do you connect all of this together? Yes, yeah, so we're actually building that out now so we're doing how how the accounts are being engaged. So we'll do meetings book, we'll do uh we have some some vanity metrics in terms of campaign influence, but we mostly focus on um we mo- mostly focus on revenue how many how many deals mm-hmm. are we closing how fast they're going through the funnel or through this opportunity pipeline um what's the acv how many contacts are we adding who's engaging stuff like that mm-hmm. got it okay what's the role of abm tech according to you so you do it some for abm and you've also been part of an uh, abm tech company right so in your previous uh job right so what's your outlook on hbm tech right so there is two views right so you don't need tech you should do it like very manually this also the other side that you start like really looking for some automation and all of that and hence you need a a tool what's your view where do you stand i think i'm in the middle i mm-hmm. so i think it can go both ways you can do scra- scrappy abm where okay. you do very Well, not basic but you do very specific tactics and then hmm. i think where abm ultimately i think where an abm platform would help is actually with the sales alerts so at six cents 
it was it was amazing because the the salespeople knew exactly when to target the accounts, and that's something that we don't have yet. And that hmm. I mean, we we have we might get Bombora, but in terms of getting like knowing exactly when to target someone in the decision stage, I think that's where it really provides value because hmm. without it, that's pretty tough. It's pretty tough to know when hmm. someone is ready to buy. And I think that's hmm. where tools bring the most value. Well, you just touched upon intent. Like how do you plan to use it or have you used it in your workflow, right? So how does intent fit in? Oh, intent. So we're, we're not doing that just yet, but next year we're probably going to start using Bambora for ABM okay. intent outbound. Hmm. So that would be more for outbound. Yep. Yeah, more for outbound. Okay. Outbound. Okay. Interesting. And uh, personalization, right? So what sort of how, how deep are this uh, nurtures, right? So when it comes to like, personalizes, you do a lot of things, right? So how, how are you able to sort of embed personalization and if at all you, you do any of that, at what channel is it highly personalized? So I think we're on the precipice of doing that. So right now hmm. it's one to many just because mm. we're, we're a younger company and we're not like, we're not doing, we're not verticalized yet. Um, mm. But I think as we grow, we're going to do more and more of that. Good. And in, in your past experience, the, I think you you're part of six sense, for example, right? So where have you seen personalization, for example, playing um, a bigger role, right? So, content that's personalized versus non-personalized, you've seen a good uh, lift because of the story. So is there any examples or any interesting campaigns that you've run, right? Maybe like the viral one that specifically around the ABM part of uh, side of things that you wanted to highlight or that work? Yes. Yeah, of course. So Six Sense used a platform that, that hyper-personalized web pages for mm -hmm. prospects. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. That's something I'd love to bring on ultimately, but they did it by, for, I think they did it by vertical and title and potentially name. And I thought that was brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that was a really great, I, I partnered with them to, to help them do that, but it was, uh, okay. it was really, really valuable. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I think this has been a fascinating conversation. A lot of thanks around uh, tapping into your experience, Jolie. Uh, any parting thoughts, right? So we're at, uh, towards the end of the year. People are planning for next year. So what kind of demands and ideas people should try? And you talked a little bit about like how we should get inspiration from B2C, right? Uh, any, any thoughts around like what are the untapped channels maybe, right? So that we should try for 2024. Yeah, great question. So something that I would love, and I think it's probably a few years out, but something that something that Netflix does fascinates mm. me. They do predictive, predictive profiling. So they're able mm -hmm. to recommend things to you based on what you like. And I would mm. love for that to come to B2B. Be. I don't know how mm. far off mm. we are, but mm. I think mm. like that and Amazon, I posted about it actually on LinkedIn, Amazon, the way they recommend products to mm. you based on your past mm. purchase history, I think mm. that could be applied to B2B one day. I think hopefully someday soon. Cause I, I think, mm. I mean, they are a couple, maybe like a trillion or $2 trillion company. So they're obviously doing something right. <laughs> Yeah, sure, absolutely. If you have the tech, what what is the how would you basically make use of it? Yeah, so I think I would so I consider and a lot of people consider this the website as a storefront. So mm -hmm. I would want so someone clicks on a piece of content and then you're based on their and this might already ha mm -hmm. be happening at least in its infancy, but someone clicks on a piece of content and then you're able to recommend either a next step or, and, and a lot of like Drift does this with conversational marketing, but you're able to recommend yeah. like a next piece of content based on mm. what they read before or, okay, mm. so they're in this stage, maybe we'll give them a case study or maybe we'll give them an RR calculator. Mm. 
or maybe we'll give them hmm. X, Y, Z based on what they wrote last. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I, th I think that makes sense. So, so how do you engage them? How do you uh, make it more contextual, right? So when they choose to come, right? Then that's if you're trading your website as a storefront, right? So you want to just keep them as much as possible. Great idea. Um, Julie, thank you so much again. Thanks for taking time. And then it's been an interesting conversation. I think a lot of tactical stuff and I think our audience would love to maybe have some learning, implement and try experiment. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for it. Thank you.